Uh, kia ora te whare. Uh, kei te tautoko i ngā mihi ko mihia, ko taku mahara ki te tūpāpaku kei tamata kapua, ko te tahi o ngā tino kaimahi o tō tātou nei iwi a te aroa whānui uh, me ngā te whakaue a Ike. Moi mai rā i te rangatira, i rongi te whakaaro, ko koe te tahi o ngā tangata i pū mau ana i te whakaaro hohonu e pāna ki te mana whakahaere o ngā hapū i runga i oa rātou nei whenua, e pū mau hoki ki tō taha o Ngāti Wai i ngā whakaaro hohonu ki tō, pā, ki tō tātou nei te riti. Ka hoki aku mahara hoki ki te wā e o rāna a tā taubi. Koia te tangata i whakakaokaongia te tahi rōpū, hei wero ki te krauna me pēhea te huarahi tōtika mō tātou tiwi Māori. I runga i te mate e kia nei te mate o te ngā whānau e kore kāinga ana. Koi nā te tono a tā taubi ki te rōpū whakamana i te tiriti. Kāre ia e whakaihia mō te pani me te rawa kore e noho ana e pohara ana, e noho ana e kore whare ana. Koi nga te tikanga o te whakahaere o te rofu whakamana i te tiriti i runga i oa ake nei whakaaro. Ko tāku nei mihi whakamutunga ki a tātou kato i tai mai ki te whakanui te kaupapa nei. Pai rawa ki te kete i kia nei the brown table o i kia nei nga bros table ki wainganui i tēnei hui ki te taha o ngā mea pohara, o ngā mea kore e whai atu i ngā pūtea, nā te kore mahi, nā te raruraru hoki o ngā whakaaro whakaparahako o te kāwanatanga. Kei te mōhu au, tērā te ua ua tanga o tēnei tu āhutanga, ko tāku nei hia hia me whai whakaaro tātou i a rātou i a tātou katoa. I wanted to start this afternoon with a minute silence because when I was asked what prompted the Y2750 inquiry by the Waitangi Tribunal, I could not separate the motivation for the um, applications that were made to the fact that during the emergency housing crisis initiated by the COVID pandemic, yes, there were a number of people relocated into Hope Motels, but more fundamentally, there was the fact that there were two murders here in Rotorua of young children. There were a number of people that were isolated from their whānau um, who actually couldn't reach out into the community to seek help because there was no help available in the scaremongering of that time. There was this idea that we were a community, but then we were isolated into our kainga by a framework of the law which um, talked about whānau ora, but really was about managing that fear to enable the government to work out how we, they would respond to the COVID crisis. So Toby um, Curtis um, gathered a group of um, those of us in the community, and I'm really glad to see Phyllis Tangitu here, because the unspoken sheroes of that period were people like Phyllis, who gave up all of her time with her whānau because of her role in mental health responsibilities at our hospital, um, to work with that rōpū to find immediate um, help, real help, you know, kai, um, petrol money, um, uh, telephone card money, so that people could contact people for help. We then were um, confronted at that next stage by a racism that is in the underbelly of this town, but was also led by Māori. People like Tiny Dean were literally pejoratively dealt with by our iwi as an outsider, trying not to help people, but um, wrongfully portrayed as someone who was there to make money off the misery of our people, and he was forcibly placing people into motels. That could not have been the furthest thing from the truth of my experience of that period. But he wasn't alone in the kind of uh, messaging that our Rotorua Daily Post and then our mayor in her current campaign continued with, saying that people were coming back to Rotorua during that time who were outsiders, who weren't Tarawa, 
who weren't Ngāti Whakaue. Well, that's right. Ngāti Whakaue still has their land, but my people of Ngāti Mākino, our land was taken because Ngāti Whakaue soldiers fought with the Crown to effect Raupatu of the Eastern Bay of Plenty Inquiry from the Waitahanui River right through to Te Whakatohia. We didn't have any land, and we still don't have any land. So where did we go in an emergency housing crisis? We came to the heartland of Tamata Kapua, which is meant to be something that unites us, to seek the aroha and manaki that we have, and to find temporary shelter. Not because we wanted to, but because we were forced to by an unusual set of circumstances. What that did, though, was to expose the fact that the homelessness, which crystallised in the paper, in the Rotorua Daily Post and on the, 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 the news every night, really exposed that the fact of homelessness is one that many of us here in Te Aroa have suffered for a long time. And that that homelessness has seen people um, forced by the transmigration policies of the state to look for cheap labour opportunities in Auckland and Wellington and other places like Christchurch, which have prevented them from coming home. And so when they were unable to afford the rent because everybody else's um, jobs were closed down, people in the hospitality industry, for example, but they weren't the only one, they came home. But they came home to a mean-spirited response from the people of Rotorua, and I'm sad to say, led by many Māori leaders in this room. Did you lead? Or did you really just kick the boot in, put the boot in on people who were actually suffering? And I've been listening all day to the good news stories that everybody's talking about how the Crown's uh, dolly, doshing out all this lolly money to people to build houses, but are they going to be building houses for the people in my whānau that I talk about? Pakitai Rahi Rahurui died in emergency housing over Christmas. Pakitai was in the Te Arawa radio for as long as I ever knew. Why couldn't Te Arawa find him a home? Why couldn't we as a whānau, I have to take personal responsibility here, find him a home? When I'm in court every day, the names are the Malcolms, okay? These are the names coming to court. The Curtises, I'm talking for my own whānau. The Fattas, the Tahanas, they all came back during this emergency um, housing crisis because of COVID, and now Gabriel, and they are still dealt with with the same mean-spirited criticism that I hear our mayor say, say, I'm really glad we've reduced the emergency housing in the motels so that those people that aren't from Rotorua aren't here anymore. Is she talking about the same people I'm talking about? Or is she characterising them in a hierarchy of structural misunderstanding of the discrimination of how policy works on those that are poor and impoverished? Because frankly, I was hoping she'd be here today because I want to confront her on those issues, because she has got to look deep in her heart to ask if those issues are more about securing the vote for herself as an individual or the national party she stands for, rather than for promoting the values of manaki, whandaungatanga, kiaitiakitanga that we've all heard about today. And I've heard a lot of talk about people being helped who on the salary band of 70,000 to 120,000. I represent those in court every day who are on 17 to 25,000 max, max. They can't afford a, um, a, a, a rent of 250 bucks a week. So they have to look at um, couch surfing. You know, let's be really clear about the living circumstances of these people. They go to Nanny, who's already got 16 mokopuna there, and they go on the couches there to find some help. And I haven't heard any kind of recognition that this housing crisis must be directed first to the most vulnerable in our communities. That has to be them. Not those on the 70 to 120,000. Frankly, you're the middle class of our world. 
I want to talk about the classless of our world, because unless we do that, we as an iwi have no class. We are becoming what I call potatoes. I like that name, chip, fish and chips, you know? White potatoes are brown on the outside or white in the middle. You know, I like the kumara picture at the end there. But really, you're all chips. You're all here, sucking up to the crown tit to get as much money as you can. And the numbers that were emerging in the discussion today were quite interesting. I just heard um, the last panel say they got a 750 million for the iwi uh, chairs to provide kind of housing to the middle class, okay? Well, uh, that while they were doing that, they actually allocated from the Department of Corrections 1.2 billion to build another facility at Waikiria to lock our people up. That's just one prison. Is that what we are actually talking about in the kinds of prioritization of spend while we don't address the systemic causes of the homelessness that have been created? Not by us. It's by a process of colonization that hasn't gone away. In fact, it was being very well mimicked just in the answers from the last panel. We can fix up managed retreat by land swaps. Well, okay, Nazi Puro. I'm not going to swap Tarawa land for your land, but give me your land, Kate the Pai. I'll give you some money for yours. But where are you going to end up looking in terms of the ancestral responsibilities of, of nurturing your whakapapa, your science, your mātauranga Māori? Because is that what has now been contemplated? We don't create what should be a proper response, a compensation framework that enables them to make choices about what they do with their land. And if they want to then build or buy back land, that's their choice. But we shouldn't be forcing people, which is what happened in the um, our 19, uh, 1860s here in Tarawa. All of us that were labeled as rebel, all my land got taken and given to Ngāti Pikiao. You know, let's be really clear what happened. And then they said we didn't exist anymore. We were invisibilized, so we actually became a non-entity when the Tarawa people were doing their um, settlement. So Ngāti Mākino went down to eight families we did at that time. We're now up at 4,000, and I'll tell you, they're building women like me. So those Ngāti Pikiao better start bringing those lands back. And they do it not because they, we want to pay for it, because it's the right thing to do. I grew up with a, a family that remembered the soldiers raping my great-grandmother. I remembered the dislocation. I remembered how our marae rota marako never had flash facilities like the rest of us in town do, just because of that historical reality. And that has continued. So when we talk about the housing crisis, we don't talk about something that just happened in the last 30 years. We have been in crisis, some of us, since they stole our land, raped our women, and dislocated us from the origins of the places that provide us with our whakapapa. And until we start dealing with the issue in that way, we are only scraping um, the, the surface, and we are only providing solutions that aren't in a bedrock, they're solutions that allow the bro table. I listened to um, Willie Jackson. He never mentioned a woman, I don't think. And any of the people he's helped, he mentioned Willie. never mentioned Willie's wife, who I'm sure Willie loves as much as all of us do. She does as much of the hard work as him. He never, ever mentioned in his corridor all of the women that are on these papakainga now trying to find a way to build solutions for us. He didn't even mention Karaina Crib, who I think is bloody amazing in heart. When we started the Waitangi Tribunal hearing, she had four people under her employment. She's now got 40. And part of that is directed to engaging with strategies that we can do. So I no wonder I sit here all day. Not good to bring me to conferences and put me the last speaker. I loved a lot of the examples of our people reclaiming tinoranga tiratanga and the ability to make change. But you need to be really clear, you're making change in what the Crown is permitting you. 
It's not real transformative change. And that's okay if you're like straight jackets, but you know, I'm a large girl. I don't like the straight jacket. I like to feel the wind on my soul. So we need to actually be very careful that we do not emulate the colonizer's house and the solutions that we are putting for ourselves. We also need to say that the housing crisis is neither in inevitable nor inescapable. We need to say that. But we then need to rethink, do we all need one house? And I want to ask this, can, who owns a house in this room? Can you put your hand up? Who keep your hand up. Who owns more than one house? So we've got about 20 in the room that own more than one house. Who doesn't own a house? And I think that's our reality. Of those that don't own a house, how many of you earn a salary over $35,000? You aren't ever going to get a house on these models because we can't get, you know, there's no affordability, but until the government changes its policy that enable us to get some solutions, we will be, be remaining in the structural dilemma of being the classless without any hope or hopelessness or opportunity to build up. Unless, of course, the rich tribes, and there are a few in this, I love, I was sitting at the Ngāti Whātua table, they're rich, Naitahu. You know, are you ready, are you ready to, not to invest, to build houses for our people to live in? Not for them to buy back, but for them to live in and have a quite different dynamic around the whole notion of home ownership. Because, of course, home ownership was only something that was introduced by the colonizers because they made land a commodity, the commodity had a value, and you suddenly measure now your well-being as a settled iwi about whether you got 1.5 billion or whether you got 3.5 billion. I don't think that that measurement is actually one of well-being. One of the things that the Waitangi Tribunal focused then, because we were all in the... Um, you know, we were all basically under house arrest because of the, um, the reality of COVID, was that the Waitangi Tribunal pro reacted to a number of tono. Um, I see Dennis is in here from uh, Te Puya Marae. They were the ones that first um, really brought the homelessness issue um, to, to impact, um, and Toby did for here in Rotorua. And the tribunal said... We're going to deal with the kaupapa inquiry into housing, but let's give a priority to homelessness. And then we heard over a period of eight weeks, with most of the hearings taking place at Te Puya Marae in Auckland, testimony, real raw testimony, of people who had been raped, who had nowhere to go, who had rung up Tiny Dean to come and pick him up, to go to the hospital, who didn't want to tell the police because they'd get a hiding. And so they had asked Tiny to provide both the security of a new, uh, a temporary shelter, but also the confidentiality of that position being maintained. We heard in Auckland how Te Puya Marae got so many donations, it overwhelmed them, but they didn't actually offer many houses for a while so that our mate Dennis Hoodie was actually managing the homeless problem for the whole of the Auckland City Council for a long time. I didn't see too many of the iwi, because a lot of the people in that were from Tarawa, um, Mātātua and Tainui. I didn't see many of them going up to say, bring them back to our marae. That was the sad thing here. When I actually asked some of our marae to open up, they go, oh, we can't do that. We've got tangi. Well, who's going to cook the kai for them while they're here? You know, we've lost all of that re immediacy of response. But people like, they were quite happy for that kind of obligation to be maintained by those at Tapuya, like her name was, that marae she created for the Pani Meterawa Kore. The same thing happened in the South Island. It was the urban Māori that provided that at Ngā Hauewha Marae. And we heard about all of these stories and how we had this reaction, but then it became really clear we were just reacting. We weren't looking at the structural causes of the dilemma and that we needed to. 
One of the unique perspectives that we heard about came from Po and I was going to read it out, but he talked about Rua Tahuna. I just, just want to say something he said. Kāinga is home as opposed to a place where one lives. It is a homeland, and for me, Rua Tahuna will always be my home, my kāinga. My house in Wellington is my whare, not my kāinga. In non-Māori terms, it would be viewed as my home, but for Māori of my generation, Hamilton is not my kāinga, and it can never be my kāinga. I don't have a relationship to the wind that blows around my house, nor do I have a relationship to the hills or the animals and creatures that live in the forest of the hills that live to my house. I don't have a relationship with the people who live in Hamilton, other than a physical relationship, and I don't have a spiritual relationship. So when we talk about putting people in these temporary transitional housing processes, aren't we just entrenching that kind of ideal? And is it any wonder that they end up on the conveyor belt to me as their lawyer in the criminal courts, and then on the conveyor belt to the 1.2 billion new facility of Waikiria, instead of using that 1.2 billion to build proper facilities for communal living for those that can least afford to do that. I love the question from the audience before about a UBI and a transformative approach. You know, I don't know, that, that, that universal basic income, if we all got everybody, say, 300 bucks a week, we could use that to buy our houses. We don't have to worry about how we're going to pay our rent. But, we you know, that's not the kind of uh, tax approach that we have in this country. Our, uh, we, we, um, we don't tax the rich, but we tax a hell of a lot of the poor, and we don't actually provide... Um, mortgage lending. Another good question is why isn't the government providing mortgage lending? You know, my mum and dad got their house because she capitalised on the uh, family benefit. You remember that? You fellas all remember that? Why don't we capitalise on family benefit? Some of my clients have all got six kids, they get heaps of putia for their deposit. You know? Why don't we do that anymore? Because we have a neoliberal framework of economic policy now, which has been mimicked, can I say, in this hui by a lot of the housing providers. And I ask, is that really transformative change or just working your processes to get the putia? Because if it is, the next government might turn the putia off and then what happens? They are back to the same situation. And I do not want to see, as I saw during the housing crisis, Komatua living on a house of a ha uh, hairdressers, two older men in their 60s living on uh, the rooftop of the, my hairdressers. That's where they stayed. I, at the, at the Tapuke bus station, there was four Komatuas living there in cardboard boxes. I don't want that. We've got to be much more imaginative in our solutions. And we, we need to find compassion and not blame for how people have ended up in their circumstances. A lot of our people have mental health issues. Gosh, I have mental health issues being around all of these parkers all the time, the way they talk to us. <laughs> but, you know, we've got to get the way to it going, a lot of uffy going, you know. I hope I don't give you mental health issues, or maybe I do, <laughs> you know. But we've got to help our whanau. I saw some really leaders in this house. I love them. You talked about Sir Uncle Bomb, I call him, and Uncle Hemana. Hemana did his per first papakainga development in the 1970s. He didn't do it for able-bodied people. He did it for the people that are tangata whai raaka at Te Teko. All of his papakainga housing were people with disabled um, disabilities. And that was his priority for his marae. You know, Uncle Bomb. He told the rickers, forget buying the Parker house, so we all built on our whānau. And, you know, we had no money back. We didn't build flash houses. That was Uncle Bomb in the 1980s. Why did they do that? Because the Labour Party came in then with their neoliberal policies and the privatisation, and they introduced all these financial instruments that took away all the things that enabled us to find pathways to home ownership. Those initiatives still exist, but I haven't seen many emerging in the current environment. You know, the, the houses provided by the marae paying for those people because they will never get a deposit to enable them to enjoy um, living circumstances then, themselves. I was only given 20 minutes, you see. They, they did this on purpose. I got really brassed off of there, and they put that all-man panel on before I could get my time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
And I said, I said to the organizers, I'm going to raise this, okay? We've got to find intergenerational solutions. And um, I'm sorry, you iwi leaders, it's hapu. It's the hapu that own the land. And in, in Ngāti Pikiao, he had nothing. It was Hinohopu that owned the land, okay? So don't you start coming now, all you iwi leaders and all men, telling us that women got no rights here, you know? It was the Māori Land Court that wanted to do Tarawa, wasn't the woman. So this is some of the realities that I think we've got to start thinking about. And I'm really worried that we've become so worried about the risk assessment and the capital investment and uh, return on investment and the putia that we forget about the fact that Uncle Lapi's uh, hot water uh, cupboard blew up and he needs a new system and it's going to cost 10 grand and he only gets 12 grand on the pension. You know, that's the realities. And where are the aroha for that? Rotoman Corporation, I'm talking to you for that. You know, um, and so when I was doing this thing, the, the, so that was why people like me went passionately to the Waitangi Tribunal and they set a process in place, and I'm just getting hoo-ha with them because everybody's leaving the Waitangi Tribunal because they're all taking jobs with Ben Dalton and his crowd at the MPI and Tarafiti because they're paying them more money. So there's not enough people to write the research recommendations. But we've got to have a watchdog like that to keep us honest and then us to keep the crown honest. And then we have to, you know, when you hear Winston Peters saying he doesn't like, what is it? He won't like any Māori names on it. He won't like Mahi, but he'll like Chip, okay? He'll like, is there, <laughs> as I understand it, he won't like any Māori name, but he'll like the Chip name because it's a Pākehā one, you know? Well, you've got to ask yourself about that. He needs educational decolonising. <laughs> and and, and we, need to, we need it, but then we need to work together. You see, we're laughing now. But how many of you have gone to see your cousin at the last motel they were staying at to make sure they had some kai? Or they were sick of watching TV with their kids screaming around in a two-bedroom place? Or that they couldn't come to the tangi for their mother because they didn't have any petrol money? You know, these are the realities of what we should be doing. And um, you don't need a government policy to do that. You just need a conscience and you need the will. And then if we have that, we can transform the world. Um, I do acknowledge some of the things. Tamati, I have to acknowledge. Willie Tahu deserves a bloody knighthood. I think I might nominate him. I don't, I, know, I was in the, the cyclones down in Tukumari Bay, in Cyclone Hale, not Gabriel. They didn't want to ring the Crown for help. They just asked me if they had, I had Willie Tahu's cell phone. <laughs> because Willie walks his talk. I want to, you know, he walks his talk. He didn't wait for everybody else to make an insurance claim. He cross-subsidised the houses so everybody who had a put here so they could think about rebuilding. Are we thinking that? I still think we're thinking that we help the middle class in our family and those poor ones and it will deal with because they're all going to jail anyway. I'm serious about this. I don't see people come to court to Totoko Alfano that often. I love Billy McFarlane because he's there for anybody and everyone. But we have got to support each other. Please stop calling people like Tiny and Billy and everybody else all the pejorative terms under the sun. We need to respect people who aren't from Te Arawa that are living here with people that are living here like Hai Hai too and work together because why? No one else is going to do it. And we need to be clever because we are clever. We're the most clever people. We've survived everything they've thrown at us for the last 200 years, and we will continue to survive. We've got the leadership models of Hemana, Eruera, and um, Bomb Gillies, of the, the ilk of that kind of person, and we've got the wherewithal if we all work together. The Waitangi Tribunal is a toothless tiger. I don't want you to think I'm saying it's the best thing since Bryce, Bryce Red, but they give a wero to the policy cha changes that the government needs to do. You know, they, they will make a recommendation we need a Māori bank. They will make a recommendation that we need a green bank, that we shouldn't be building houses without solar and looking at the way we have infrastructural needs of our toilets. The Waitangi Tribunal will link the climate crisis with the housing crisis, but more fundamentally with the tangata whenua denial crisis and the constitutional change we need. So on that night, I hope you have a good party tonight. 
We're going to Te Whare Wānanga o Awanui Arangi tomorrow. They've done a mahiranga tira. They're giving a doctorate to one of the favourite komatua I love in the world, Tiriaki Amuamu. Thank you, Ngāti Awa. And so we won't be here tonight or tomorrow. But please, do not be duped that capitalism has the answer. That is just as colonising as the Crown having the answer. We have tikanga as the first law of this country and the values in it provide the answer. And the models should not be just mirror images of the crowns making, but should be one that are created about the, by the imagination of us all. And women, can I dare say it? We are the ones that are the dancers and singers and liberators of our, of our world. So we've got to allow our men and our boys, our children, our nephews to dance and sing with us. So they, they see the politics of kindness in action, and they remember that. And Ngāti Whakaue, you did that on the stage at Matatini. Um, as much as I hate to admit it, because none of my Ngāti Pikiao ones won, okay, I was so proud because I saw Tinga and Rawiri and everybody that I'd loved as a child come alive who were the prophets of that kaupapa. So, kia ora.